Mr. Amian, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the head office of Hapag Lloyd here in Hamburg at Ballindam. It's a pleasure to be here and to have this interview with you, which are we are recording for Marine Money and which is to be broadcasted at the Marine Money Ship Finance and Decarbonization Conference. Before we start diving into the questions, a few facts about Hapag Lloyd. Hapag Lloyd operates a fleet of 234 modern container ships between feeder size and in excess of 20,000 TEU. It has a total transport capacity of 1.7 million TEU and a container capacity of about 2.7 million TEU. They are working worldwide, 13,200 employees in about 400 offices in 129 countries. Habak Lloyd operates 121 liner services and uh, they call about 600 ports worldwide. You joined the company in 2014. You are a Dutch national and you are in your early 50 years, which is, I can tell this from own experience, a very good age to be at. I read in interviews you like watching ice hockey matches and you are supporting the local football club of HSV. And this was the first point I stumbled in your Vita because I thought this cannot be actually. What went wrong in your socialization back in 2014 when you came to Hamburg deciding for HSV and not for St. Pauli, the much better club, the better team and the team and the club with a much closer ties to the port of Hamburg? Yeah, not so much, I think, to be honest. I mean, I come also from, uh, from, I come from Rotterdam, as you may have read. And, you know, there I've been always a supporter of Feyenoord, which is a team that's very much comparable to HSV. Yeah. Yeah and less so to St. Pauli, and I would also remind you of the, you know, the, if you look at the league tables, even in the second Bundesliga, then, then usually HSV is still further up than St. Pauli. Let's forget Corona and let's forget corporate governance for a second. Let's assume I've got two sets of tickets for you for two different sports matches. One is the Crocodiles Hamburg against their next league opponent, and the other match is the local derby HSV versus St. Pauli. Which match would you go to and whom would you take with you? I would go to Haasvau against uh, St. Pauli. I would probably take, take my wife. Yeah. Your wife. Excellent. Yeah. Let's come to, to the maritime world. As the CEO of a company operating over 200 ships, I assume you're visiting your ships from time to time. When was the last time you visited one of your ships? I mean, we do it from time to time. Yeah. Uh, although, I mean, realistic. I mean, recently uh, throughout COVID, of course, there are all kinds of restrictions. I think last time we were out there was probably in October. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we're coincidentally going again the next Sunday. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I mean, on average, we try to do that a couple of times a year. And I think you know the main reason to do that is to you know pay respect to the crews and yeah, also show them our appreciation for the work that they are doing. Which, of course, especially if you look at last year. That's been pretty tough on, on many of them, yeah, with a lot of extended stays uh, on board of the vessels and all kinds of difficulties that we had around crew changes. And I think these people have done a phenomenal job, yeah, uh, over the over many years, but especially the year, last year to keep things going. We are now coming to the most recent very good news about Hapag Lloyd. Um, whilst 2020 was already a very good year or considerable good year for the company, I understand that you yesterday released news that the company is doing a fantastic first quarter. Can you tell us more about it? The outlook is, is uh, still quite uncertain. I think we've had a good 2020 mm -hmm. on the back of good cost control and, and slightly higher rates and a strong rebound of demand in the second half of the year. If we look at the first quarter, then you see all the things coming together. There's a huge demand out there uh, because of that freight rates have been um, very high and uh, also in a historical perspective and, and of course if you move 1 million TU a month yeah, like we do then every hundred dollars that every TU um, you know, generates more immediately has a big effect on the result. Was this um, unexpected good fourth quarter of 2020 and this very good quarter of 21 was this a surprise to Hapag Lloyd and if so what do you expect for how long will the boom last? To be honest, I think nobody expected this upswing in the second half of the year. I mean, if you look, if you listen to all the experts, whether they are Clarkson's or Drury or IMF, then everybody predicted doom and gloom in the course of, the, of 2020, especially as we got into Q2, when of course demand really plummeted. Uh, and then all of a sudden, 
without a lot of pre-warning, we saw a huge rebound of demand as people were apparently spending more money on goods yeah, as they couldn't go to restaurants and on holiday and, and do all the other things that they normally do. And that resulted in a lot of uh, additional demand for container transportation as from, I would say, September onwards. And in fairness, nobody really saw that coming. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't either. And of course, then uh, you see that the, the global supply chains are then really stretched, even if I think that if you take a little bit uh, of a distance to what has really happened, then you know, shipping actually managed to keep things going, yeah, despite the tremendous amount of restrictions and difficulties around the globe over the last 12 months. Yeah. Would it make sense to steam faster these days? I mean, we, we actually speed up quite a bit in these days, but sometimes that only has a um, that doesn't always make sense. I mean, to give you the example of, uh, of LA Long Beach, I think very well known to everybody. I mean, there's 34 or 35 ships waiting outside. Yeah? So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to speed up from Shanghai to, to LA to just be you know, a couple of hours or a day earlier in a queue that uh, may, may last a week or longer. Hapag Lloyd as a shipping company has certainly a lot of long-term contracts with a longer lifetime, which means they cannot initially or immediately benefit from the good and booming markets. Can you tell us more about that? What is the mix between long-term engagement and, and short-term engagement? I mean, both on the revenue side as well as on the cost side, there's quite a lot of it which is fixed for a longer period of time. I, I think roughly 35 or 40 percent of our business is locked in for about a year or so. Yeah? And that means, of course, that also until the end of last year, we've been carrying that at the rates that we have contracted. Then there's a piece of it that's, get, that's contracted on a quarterly basis and, and some of it goes on a spot basis. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if in the end you look at 2020, you saw that in, I think in the end, our rates across the year were up on average about 4%, which is really a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that's also where you see that it takes time before you see that reflected in the rates. On the cost side, it's a little bit similar. Yeah? Uh, because when you look at charter ships, I mean, we charter anyway not too much. Yeah? I mean, we have a fairly high percentage of the fleet that we own. Yeah? Uh, then we have a whole bunch of charters that were fixed anyway um, for multiple years already before the end of this year. And of course, we also have some short-term charters for which you at the moment have to indeed pay a, pay a high price. Yeah? And then finally, the factor that people don't talk about all that much at the moment is, of course, oil. Yeah? I mean, oil was very expensive in the beginning of last year. Everybody's forgotten that. Yeah? Uh, I think the oil price in January, February was about $700 a ton. Then it came down to well below 200 and now it's climbing again. I think I saw this morning that we are again around 475 or so. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so yes, costs are also fluctuating quite a bit and to some extent you can protect yourself for that, but uh, you know, some things is just the market. Thanks to the very good times, a lot of money has been earned in the shipping industry and also Hapag Lloyd is benefiting from the existing market environment, which is probably money you can well spend in new ships. I understand Hapag Lloyd has recently ordered a series of 623,500 TEU LNG dual fuel ships. Can you tell us more about this order? the reasons for it and the philosophy behind it? First of all, um, the last ships we had ordered were, uh, was, I think the last ships we ordered were the, was the Valparaiso class and I think we ordered that in 2015. So, of course, at some stage you need to renew the fleet. So that's the first point. Yes, we had to invest and I think that's been in the cards for a while. Yeah. Um, then the question is in which vessel class do we invest? Well, we are certainly underrepresented in the big ships. Yeah. So it was logical to go for say, a couple of 23, 24,000 TU ships. And then the question is, of course, what kind of propulsion do you use? And, and uh, we have opted after looking at that for very long to, to go for dual fuel, uh, because we do believe that uh, that's at least a good uh, transition type of fuel yeah, uh, on the way to going to uh, zero, zero carbon emissions. Yeah. And on top of that, the engines that we put in, of course, have also the option to work on synthetic. Yeah. Uh, gas, yeah, which of course would bring you closer to a carbon, carbon neutral vessel, yeah, even if that's not available today. We are doing our sustainability strategy and we'll come up with some probably fairly aggressive objectives that we would like to achieve by 2030 yeah, or so. Okay, and then we need to see again what can be done after that, yeah, because technology 
will develop further and there will be more options available at some stage but I don't think we're close yet to um, getting engines available that can be carbon neutral that can be used on really big container ships. I read that Hapag Lloyd also refitted one of its 15,000 TEU ships into a pure LNG ship which is quite interesting because that is of course if you want so still a class on its own why did you do that? Is that more a test ship for you to see how a purely powered LNG ship is operated? When we merged with UASC, uh, we inherited their fleet and, and in that fleet there were uh, 17 vessels that were so-called LNG ready. So they can be converted to LNG and uh, before committing to do that with all the ships, we said okay, we better do one first and see if it works. Uh, I think w well, what we have learned is that Technically, it will probably work. I mean, the ship is coming out of the yard pretty much as we speak. Um, but economically, it's very questionable whether it's viable going forward to do more ships because in the end, uh, I think the, the conversion cost is about $35 million, yeah? which was certainly more than we had planned. And, and also when we look at how much more efficient can we make it if we do it again, uh, we are not getting close to a number which would make it economically viable to do the remaining 16. What do you believe are the major problems in operating an LNG-powered ship? Is it the supply of LNG in the different ports or is it more the methane slip? I mean, the, the supply is probably the topic that people talk the most about. Uh, that will probably be a bit of an issue with the, um, with the first ship that we've now converted because it's, the infrastructure is not that mature. On the other hand, for one ship you can definitely organize that. If I forward, fast forward two or three years, then I don't think we're going to have major issues uh, with LNG supply on the main routes, and that's where we would deploy the ship. So I don't see that as a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And then there are, of course, other things to be managed, like uh, methane slip, and yeah, where uh, of the type of engine that you use is very important. And you know, we try to take all kinds of measures to manage that as, as good as we can, but we're still in the beginning of that project, so it's still a bit too early to declare victory on that yet. Who is paying for the decarbonization in the end? Is it the customers? Is it the consumers? In the end, I think uh, nobody's going to pay for it, but we're probably all going to benefit from it, because when you look at it from a global and a world perspective, then the reason why we all want to decarbonize is because it's good for, for the globe and for the generations that come after us. Yeah. Uh, short term, it might cause some, some additional investment. On the other hand, it depends very much on what the prices of the various fuels will do, uh, whether it in the end is going to be more expensive or less expensive. Uh, as LNG has generally a, a higher calorific value than uh, the traditional bunker, yeah one would think that, that over time, yeah, also because LNG is actually f fairly widely available across the globe, that it's probably also not going to be more expensive than, than burning uh, the other types of fuel, where you will very likely also get some kind of carbon tax yeah, in the years to come. And, and because carbon emissions are anyway a lot lower yeah, with LNG than they are with traditional bunker, that's also a benefit. How does Hapag Lloyd in principle finance its fleet? What is the mix between ordinary finance and lease finance and are you tapping other sources of finance as well? I think we we found a, um, a combination of a Chinese lease and then a Korean uh, uh, insured or a casual type fin financing in, uh, in Korea. That makes sense because by doing that we could probably optimize the, uh, the pricing yeah? um, and, and it are indeed the typical vehicles that we have used also over the last years. We've also looked at other options like, you know, you have insurance, pension funds and those type of people. But in the end, this was the most cost efficient for us. And yeah, that's why we did it. The new series of six 23,500 TEU ships is financed according to green principles, the London Market Association green chip financing principles. Can you tell us why Hapag Lloyd has decided for this and what the benefits are? The reason why we do it in the end is to also underline that we are committed to making the world a little bit greener. Yeah? And uh, dependent, uh, and if you, if you qualify for this type of, of label, then that 
means also some kind of commitment to us to continue to work on reducing emissions also in the years to come. Because we do commit to those principles and we do take the action. So then I think it's also right to take the type of financing with a label that also, you know, sort of signs that off or certifies that we are indeed doing the right thing. And, and you are right. I mean, if you, if you look ahead into the next 5, 10, 15 years, then decarbonization and generally making shipping cleaner yeah, will be a very, very important topic for everybody in our industry. Hapag Lloyd was founded in Hamburg in 1847. You are working in Rotterdam, you are working in Hamburg and other places. I assume you are traveling quite a lot. Looking at Hamburg as a Dutchman and not as a born Hamburger, you may have a clearer picture as to what is good and what is bad. How do you see Hamburg and how do you see Germany as a shipping hub? What are the advantages and where is room to improve? I mean, first of all, I was born in Rotterdam, but I work from Hamburg. Yeah? Uh, and if I'm not working from Hamburg, I'm probably traveling, although that's not been a lot over the last uh, 12 months or so. I would still say that Hamburg is probably still the shipping capital of Europe, yeah? uh, because even if it's maybe less the center than it was 10 years ago or so, uh, I mean, there's still a lot of maritime industry and logistics industry that's anchored here in, in Hamburg, and you feel that every day, and for us, that's also good. Yeah? Um, no, because there are all kinds of things that are relevant for us that you can basically reach within a 20 minute walk. Mr. Haben Jansen, thank you very much for having this interview here with me today. It was very interesting. Thanks to Hapag Lloyd and thank you very much to Marine Money for making this interview possible. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.